First Kings 19, 1 through 18. It's in your pew Bible on page 382. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake of baked bread on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Methola, Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You may be seated. Thank you, Elaine, for reading that scripture. Now I know how to say some of those names. You know, here's a secret. You know, the pastors, we don't really know always how to say those names. We just say it, like, with confidence. And then people think we know what we're doing. But uh, one of the things that... uh, as, you're, as you grow up as a child in the church, you hear all of these wonderful stories about the heroes of the Bible. And I think one of the things that happens, unfortunately, is we forget they're human. That they struggle, too. And, you know, a lot of times we hear the story of Elijah and how he defeats the prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. But this is a passage of scripture we overlook. And so we're going to look at this passage and we're going to actually deal with the topic of loneliness and despair and discouragement this morning. Not a popular topic. In fact, uh, yesterday, the way the storm kept going and going, I thought I was going to be the only one here. So I was uh, already dealing with loneliness and the thought that I would be preaching to no one. But... uh, 
You know, the thing about loneliness is this, is you can be in a room full of people. You can be laughing at jokes, having great conversations, and you can be lonely. You can actually have a great family, a wonderful you know, spouse, and think everything's going great, and you can be lonely. You can wrestle with all kinds of things privately, and we can fake it, can't we? And so I was kind of looking up on Google some articles on loneliness, and I, I came across this one. It is about pastors, and I'm not quoting this because I want you to feel bad for me or for the pastoral staff, but I just want you to understand that pastors, like Elijah, go through discouragement, loneliness, and struggle. The article is from uh, David Roach, and the article's name is, it's a poll. Many pastors feel lonely, discouraged. A full 98% agree with the statement, I feel privileged to be a pastor. And 93% of those strongly agree with that statement. And only 0.5 pastors disagree with that statement. So it starts off pretty good, doesn't it? Yet more than half. 55% also agree with the statement, I find, I find that it's easy to get discouraged. And 55% also say that being in pastoral ministry makes them feel lonely at times. This is not saying that it's every day. It's just saying that there are times when they struggle. Again, this is not a plea, don't feel bad for me or the pastoral staff. It's simply stating that pastors, like Elijah, like, to be honest, all of us in here, struggle with loneliness and discouragement. In fact, I did hear on the radio just uh, two weeks ago, the report was that 35% of the general public struggles with loneliness. So think about that. There is a good, uh, likely odds that you're sitting next to someone who is lonely. Someone who came here this morning feeling pretty down in the dumps, discouraged. In fact, uh, the Beatles kind of made it uh, maybe even popular when they sang the song Eleanor Rigsby. All the lonely people, where do they come from? All the lonely people... Where do they all belong? I hope they belong in the church, that the church is a safe place where they can actually be lonely but also be loved. And so we're going to look at that topic uh, a little closer. You know, Elijah, in the previous weeks, we saw him win a great battle over evil. He's a man of God. He's a man of prayer. And so if there's anyone that would not seem to be able to struggle with loneliness, it would be Elijah. But we find in this text, though, is that he is incredibly discouraged. He's ready to give up. He's ready to go hide in a cave. What I want you to understand, first of all, is this. Feeling lonely, discouraged, or in despair is not a sin. Now, some people will actually treat it that way, but the Bible does not teach that. And so a person who is feeling lonely, don't, don't think that I am less spiritual. You're just struggling in a fallen world. And until we get to heaven, there's going to be loneliness. There's going to be discouragement. There's going to be despair. In fact, here's a really tough question. Do you think Jesus was ever lonely? Do you think he suffered with loneliness, discouragement, and despair? What do you think of these texts? Jesus takes two of his disciples, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he wants to go there to pray. And he asks them to accompany him. And he, he says, sit here while I go over there and pray. 
And as he's praying, he's pouring his heart out to God. And then he comes back, which really was probably not as far as we think. And what, what, what is happening? His disciples are asleep. And I think Jesus is discouraged. And really what he wants is companionship. He's aware that he's going to go to the cross. He's prayed that his will would surrender to the will of his Father. But really what he wants is Peter and James to kind of just be there for him. And they fell asleep. I also think that Jesus was probably uh, experienced loneliness in a way that you and I never will. The reason I say that is while he was on the cross, he prayed the prayer that is found in Psalm 22. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think in all of human history before and all of human history after, that was the loneliest anyone has ever felt because he was ripped away from his relationship with his Father because of our sin, because of the brokenness of this world. He felt the forsakenness of God. So in a way, Jesus knows what it's like to be lonely. He can relate to our loneliness. One of the biggest struggles with loneliness is that when we are lonely, we tend to gravitate towards behavior that feeds that loneliness. We feel bad and so we avoid people when maybe actually the best thing we can do is actually go and be with a friend rather than to hide in our own caves. We tend to focus on the negative perspective and we feed the fuel of the fire of our loneliness. Now, I'm not saying that's easy to get over loneliness. And there can be people that suffer from chronic loneliness that is far greater than just a bad day. To which I think we need to be extremely sensitive and caring and loving towards that individual or individuals. You know, Elijah was going through this incredible moment of loneliness. He felt all alone. There was nobody left. He was just the only prophet who ever really stuck out and was faithful to God. Of course, we find a little later that there's more. So he withdraws and throws himself really a pity party in that cave. And uh, we're going to show a little video here, and I'm not minimizing loneliness at all by showing this video. It's kind of a cheesy kid's song, and the singing is even more cheesy. <laughs> I would ask uh, Mill to come up and sing along, but he refused. He told me no. So let's see this uh, little video clip. You're probably familiar with this song. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I guess I'll go eat worms. Long, thin, slimy ones, short, fat, juicy ones, itsy bitsy, fuzzy, wuzzy worms. Cause nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. That's when I'll go eat some worms. Long, thin, slimy ones, short, fat, juicy ones, itsy bitsy, fuzzy, wuzzy worms. I like to bite their heads off, suck their guts out, throw the skins away. Tweet. I don't see how birds can live Only eating them three times a day Well, long, thin, slimy ones go down easily Short, fat, juicy ones don't Itsy bitsy ones get stuck in your teeth And fuzzy ones tickle your throat Well, down goes the first one Oh, down goes the second one Oh, how do I make a squirm? Hey, get over here Long, thin, slimy ones, short, fat, juicy ones, itsy bitsy, fuzzy, wuzzy worms. But then, <laughs> comes the first one, comes the second one. Oh, how do we go, Landy Squirm? Long, thin, slimy ones, short, fat, juicy ones, itsy bitsy, fuzzy, wuzzy worms. 
Cause when nobody likes me, everybody hates me. That's when I go eat some worms. Long, thin, slimy one, short, fat, juicy one. Itty bitty, fuzzy, wuzzy worm. Thirsty. Well, probably in the history of the church, we're the only church that's ever listened to that song. <laughs> in worship. And it is funny, but loneliness, discouragement, and despair is not funny. And whereas people that are struggling with those things probably don't eat worms, they can do destructive behaviors, cutting themselves, gravitating towards drugs and alcohol, um, committing suicide. And where does the church and how does the church respond to that. Elijah probably related to that song. He probably could have said, that's my life in a nutshell. Now I'll say this, in 20 minutes, a message on Sunday morning cannot cover every aspect of such a serious topic. It cannot resolve loneliness for you. But I do want you to hear what Elijah heard from God. And that short message is, you are not alone. We read in verse 18, you will leave, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah wasn't alone. He just felt like he was alone. Now, uh, over the years of going to different pastors' retreats and conferences, and in the middle of all of the fun that we're having, there are occasional times when we pastors get serious. You need to know that. You're not sending a pastor away to have fun all the time, although we have a lot of fun. There are times when we talk. We talk about ministry. And one consistent theme that has come up over all of those times is just about every pastor I've known at some time has sat at their desk and wanted to quit. They're discouraged. They're lonely. They're in despair. And so we can understand what Elijah is feeling here. Although it maybe isn't accurate, it is the feeling is true. The feeling is true. And that's one thing we cannot deny Feelings are true. There are opportunities, though, to respond properly. And again, I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, of all the pastor friends that I've had that went to seminary with me, there is but a remnant left in ministry. So it's, it's amazing uh, how hard ministry can actually be. And I'm not saying that again as a plea for your pity. Not at all. It's just the reality, and I want us to relate to Elijah. I'm sure Elijah was saying to God, God, prove that you're here. Can't you do something and blazon it across the sky? Can't you just let me know that I'm not alone? And, you know, God could have answered that way, could he have not? He's God, after all. In fact, sometimes God does answer that way. When I was thinking of the time when... Uh, uh, Brenda and I were dating and planning on getting married. Uh, we were in the process, or I was in the process, of interviewing at uh, different churches. And the church in Omaha, Nebraska, West Hills, I was interviewing there. And in the middle of the interview, it started to rain really hard. And then there was thunder and lightning. And all of a sudden, a lightning bolt hits the church, and all the lights go off. And we're in the basement protecting ourselves from the big bad storm that could be taking our lives away. And, and uh, the interesting thing was, is I didn't know what that meant. But I went home and I got the letter from Brenda, which Brenda and I uh, pretty much wrote a letter almost every day to one another. And in that letter, it said, I wish God would send a lightning bolt to tell us what to do. I guess we went to West Hills, in which we did, and we had many great years of ministry. You see, sometimes God does answer in a bold 
way, doesn't he? But not in this passage. Not in this passage. Because it wasn't in the earthquake. It wasn't in the fire. It wasn't in the wind. It was in the whisper. And sometimes it's the whisper that actually awakens us to God's presence. And instead of you know, trying to explain that, I thought I'd just read at least 10 Bible verses that tell us that. And if you can't get them all down, you can ask for the scriptures a little later. But Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 8, the Lord himself goes before you it will not be, or, and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Joshua 1, 5, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. 1 Kings 8, 57, May the Lord our God be with us as he, is, as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us. 1 Chronicles 28, 20, David also said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the world or until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Psalm 37, 28, For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever, but the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. Psalm 94, 14, For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. Isaiah 41, 17, The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Isaiah 42, 16, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough paths smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. Hebrews 13, 5, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The message, I think, from these scriptures is fairly clear. God is with us. It doesn't always feel that way, does it? Sometimes you're like Elijah. God, where are you? Why aren't you here, God? Why don't you answer me, God? That's a real feeling. The promise is that he will not leave us or forsake us, but sometimes we wish he would prove himself. And I've heard it and maybe even said it myself many times. Uh, God, I need Jesus with skin on. I need to see you. And I think that's where the church gets involved. I really hope that uh, nobody leaves this place lonely. That maybe is wishful thinking. Maybe it's even seemingly impossible thinking. But I would hope that anyone who comes to church at this church would not leave lonely. That they would know that they've Connect it with someone. That there's someone with Jesus with skin on them for, for them today. That they would not be judged. That they would not be mistreated. But that they would be listened to and loved. So let's pray. Holy Father, I am convicted with the reality that one third of the world is lonely that there are people here that are lonely this morning. And Lord, that thought can be overwhelming, except 
We can be Jesus with skin on. We can love people. We can accept people where they're at. And, and we can listen. And, and we can make a difference. And so, Lord, uh, as we come to the Lord's table, the table where we celebrate your presence. Lord, I'm asking for healing. I'm asking for an individual or individuals to really truly experience your presence in their life in a way that will help them in the midst of their struggle, their loneliness. So Lord, we thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you are real and that you are present. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we come to the Lord's table, that's what I want to encourage you with. This represents what Christ has done for us, but it also represents that he's real, he's here right now. That he wants to minister to each and every one of us. And as I prayed, I really want everybody to come here knowing that God wants to meet you, that Jesus wants to meet you. And if you need Jesus with skin on, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm like Elijah. I struggle. I've been discouraged. I've been lonely. If I can help, Seth has been there. If he can help, Ed, if he can help. And there's numerous other people I know in this room that would love to just love you and pray with you and listen. Uh, but this table represents the presence of Christ. So at this time, I'd ask the servers to come forward. This table is for any and all who have put their faith and trust in Christ. It's even for people who are searching for Christ. We celebrate this morning by intinction, which means you'll take a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup and then receive them together. If you need to be gluten-free, we have gluten-free bread in the center. On the night in which Jesus Christ was betrayed, another feeling of loneliness, I'm sure, by Judas Iscariot, he took bread. He also was denied another feeling of loneliness he felt, and he gave those people that betrayed and denied him a gift. He took that bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, the cup that represents the new covenant, which is the shedding of his, his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And he said, drink this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that your love sent your son Christ to meet us in our greatest need, our sin. And then the, all of the consequences of sin, the fallenness and brokenness of this world, which includes loneliness, discouragement, and despair. You meet us with the cross and with the resurrection. Lord, help us to come forward and feel your presence this morning in a powerful way. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.